A little background information about me. I am a female, Colombian, 29 years old, athletic and adventurous. I enjoy traveling, walking, hiking, and camping. This happened about six years ago. On one of these trips, I was with my ex-boyfriend and our two dogs. He had a crossbreed, brown lab-looking dog, and mine is a golden retriever. Not scary dogs at all, but certainly big and with powerful barks. We always went walking with them on trails and exploring around the city limits. But this time, he had heard about this river in the middle of the mountains with a huge cascade. The place was described to him by his college mates, and it sounded beautiful. We packed simple bags with sandwiches, snacks, water, and beer, and off we went. Once we made it to the beginning of the trail, the dogs seemed impatient. They were very active when they were together, so we assumed they just wanted to run and we let them loose. The mountain started out in a very steep way. We pretty much had to climb along sharp rocks for about 15 minutes before we could reach the actual trail. Keep in mind, Colombia is nothing like the United States. Our wild areas are actually wild. No trails designated, no forest rangers, no watchtowers. Once you are out of the city limits, you are pretty much on your own, and there is certainly no cops or anything around these areas. They are highly underpopulated and overall deserted. Once we reached the trail, we noticed it was hardly visible. Trails are usually patches of the forest that are not as prominent, so you can see somewhat of a trail left, but it was made by people or animals walking around, so it gets very faint sometimes, and many times you don't see it or have no idea where to go. This trail was like that, which we actually liked, because that meant there would be no people around bothering us, and we could smoke and enjoy the river on our own. We got excited and kept walking through the almost invisible trail. A little ways down, we started hearing branches break, voices, and a bit of laughter. We looked at each other with disappointment, because we wanted to be alone. We kept walking, and then saw some colors and shapes through the bushes. They stopped as well and saw us. The elderly man waved, and he was getting closer. His wife walked behind, holding his elbow. They walked slowly as we exchanged pleasantries about the day. When they reached us, he looked up at us as he was petting the dogs and said, You guys heading back? We responded with, No, actually we just got started. We wanted to reach the waterfall in the mountain over there. He looked at where I was pointing and frowned. I found it odd, and then he replied, you guys should be careful. I hear a lot of stories about people getting lost in these parts, or even worse. You're better off heading back with us. We both thought the old man was just being a wet blanket, and we were somewhat experts in trails, hiking, and camping. So my ex said, Nah, we'll be fine. We have these two beasts to protect us. We all kinda chuckled. He then said, Well anyway, be very careful. And you, sweetheart, you should tuck in that little golden chain inside your shirt. You never know who is looking for stuff like that to yank off. I had yet to think about that. I was wearing a little golden chain on my neck. Except it wasn't golden, it was 24 carat, and was given to me by my godfathers when I was born. It was a tradition in my family that every time a baby was born, all the uncles, aunts, Friends and close family members gave gold accents with different shapes and forms, as well as a chain to hang them all from. This is a Colombian thing, and it mostly ensures good luck for the new baby, as the three wise men did to Jesus. I had found the chain on my mom's safe during my last visit to her house, and have been wearing it ever since. No accents, though, just the chain. I grabbed it instinctively 
and tucked it inside my shirt collar. We said our goodbyes with the couple, and off we went. We were hiking for over an hour, stopping here and there, to take pictures, drink water, or give the dogs a treat. We were almost at the mountain. We could faintly hear the waterfall. The next part of the way was rougher, though. We had to climb down this cliff, and we didn't bring any gear, so we had to be extra careful with the dogs, but they did it rather quickly and with no hassle. While I was heading down, though, my ex was waiting for me at the base of the cliff with his dog. Mine had turned back to come down again with me. She always does this when she's hiking with me. But she stopped at the top and stared at the woods and then started growling. This is weird. My dog is by far the sweetest dog ever and she never growls. But this time she seemed fierce. She kept growling more and more while I called for her. For Mina! She would stop every now and then to stare back at the woods, but eventually got down with me, and we kept walking. The mountains have created a natural junction, with water falling from the very top to a clear pond at the bottom. The water was freezing cold, and the noise was pretty intense. The dogs were beyond themselves. They started running, jumping, chasing each other, barking and swimming. We took off our clothes and jumped in as well. It was amazing. The cold water, against the hot weather, felt like heaven. Plus we were stoned, so the sensations were very strong. We kept playing in the water for a while. Then we got out and sat on the rocks to smoke some more. A few minutes later, we heard the dogs barking, but not playfully like before. They were barking loud and menacingly. We looked at them, and they were both at the very edge of the pond, staring at the woods on top of the mountain, the fur on their backs raised. I called for Mina again, and my boyfriend called his dog, but they didn't flinch. Their paws were firm on the ground. I got up and walked over there and grabbed Fermina by her torso, just kind of giving her a hug and pulling her towards me. She snapped out of it and started licking me ferociously. I kept asking, what's wrong girl, what's wrong? And she just whimpered. I said, screw this, I'm out of here. She's acting really weird. Rebecca, his dog, always barked at everything, so he wasn't concerned at all. He agreed though, and we started packing. Then I heard something. A whistle. It was definitely a human whistle. It sounded like a little melody. First a long one, and then two short ones. I stopped and tried to hear it again, over the barking and the waterfall, but I didn't hear it. We started walking back to the cliff, and the dogs were getting worse. It was almost impossible to hear anything besides them. I started climbing first. My ex was behind me, and the dogs made it to the top in no time, and continued going nuts. I kept telling Fermina to shut it, but she wouldn't, and then I finally made it to the top. Then I heard it. Branches breaking. The dogs got even more aggressive. They started running towards the edge of the forest back and forth to where I was. I just stood there, staring. More branches breaking. They were getting louder. I knew someone was there, getting closer with each step. I kept trying to see past the tree line, but only saw green, brown, and darkness. But then a figure started emerging from it. First I thought it was another couple, or maybe just a hiker like us. But this figure was moving in a weird way. He was a little bit too heavy to be a hiker, and slow, and had no backpack, but he was holding something in front of him. A shotgun. I freaked out. Rebecca almost attacked the guy when he came out of the woods. He was stocky, wearing a black jacket, shotgun pointed straight at me. I yelled at Rebecca to stop and come here, and she actually did. Weird, because she never listens. He then said, Tell your boyfriend to come up. 
and I took a couple of steps back. I was almost on the edge and stared down. My boyfriend was almost there and he had heard the voice of the man. He hurried up and climbed to where I was. I was standing there, petrified, not being able to talk, just looking at the dark circle of the shotgun barrel. Then I caught a glance of something shiny, something metal-looking. He had a machete hanging from his belt loop. I grabbed my boyfriend's hand as he stood up on the top of the cliff and stared at the man. My ex was nothing less than scary. He was easily 6'8". His green eyes glared as he stared at the man, and then he said, Take what you want and leave us. The dogs were still going crazy. The guy looked at me and pointed the gun as he said, Grab those dogs and shut them up, or I'll shoot them both right here. I called them softly and grabbed Fermina by the collar. She started licking me and whimpering. Rebecca was a little rascal. With her, I kind of crawl on the ground and grab her by the back leg. She then turned around and I grabbed her collar. I held them both close to me, petting them, whispering, shh, it's okay. It's okay, over and over. I was in tears by then, but my ex stood his ground. I saw his fists and he had them tightly closed as if he was going to punch the guy. Then the guy whistled. It was the same whistle I heard before, the long one and then two short ones. Two more figures came out of the woods. One of them had a revolver. The guy then said to my ex, Don't try anything stupid, pretty boy. We were trapped. He then said, Give me the bags. We took them off and slid them on the ground closer to him. And then he said, Stand up, looking at me. I could now see his face. He had sunspots all over, and really bad acne. His eyes were dark and small, like bird's eyes. His hair was greasy and covered with a dirty black beanie. A big round nose completed the look, and gave him an almost comical appearance. Nothing comical about the shotgun, though. I stood up, holding the collars of the dogs tight, and then he said, Mmm, not bad. He then turned to the guy with the revolver and said, Bring me that gold chain. I kinda gasped when he said that, and the other guy started walking towards me. The dog started pulling. He stopped and looked at them, and then at the other guy and said, I don't like these fuckers. Let's just get rid of them. I was full on crying by then, and just said, No, please hold on, I'll get it for you. Holding both collars with one hand, I yanked the chain off my neck and then turned and gave it to my ex. He grabbed it and stared at me. He knew how much it meant to me, but it was either that or our lives. So he walked towards the guy and gave it to him. One of the guys asked his friends, Have you ever had your way with a little spoiled girl? And they all laughed. I felt like throwing up. My ex looked even angrier now. He said, we don't have anything else, please let us go. Then the guy said, you do have something else. And then gave me a perverted look that made my skin crawl. My ex then said, sure you can have your way with her. So calmly that I thought he was giving me away. But then he added, after you fucking cowards fight me one by one and beat me till I'm dead, cause that's the only way. They all laughed at this. And then he said, Nah, not worth it. I can just shoot you and be done with it. And then pointed the gun at him. I couldn't believe this is how our lives were going to end. A thousand thoughts were going through my head. I was shivering. Then I heard this really faint whistle, very far away. The guy with the shotgun stopped laughing and stood still, as if trying to listen better. And the whistle happened again. But this time, the first whistle was way longer, and the three of them started walking backwards, almost retracing their steps. The guy said, You two fuckers are in luck, and turned around. They disappeared as fast as they had shown up. My ex and I exchanged looks of astonishment, and then vaulted out of there, 
running through the woods like maniacs. We didn't stop, we didn't talk, we didn't even look back. We just ran and stumbled until we were in the first area again. We then started walking at a slower pace, wondering how we would enter the flat without any keys. They were in my backpack. When I was younger, we lived near a big forest that had an old brick school in the middle. It was a pretty small building. My parents never let me or my siblings play in the forest without an adult because the local gangs liked to party or fight there. I had three older brothers who didn't listen, of course, because the forest was a great place to practice their slingshot skills. I used to tag along because we didn't have anyone else to look after me during the summer besides our grandma, who was slowly losing her memory and would sometimes talk to herself. One afternoon, while sitting on the back of my second oldest brother Laura's bike, we were hunting for squirrels, when my third oldest brother, Jameson, yelled out that he'd seen an albino squirrel. My eldest brother took off in Jameson's direction, with Laura and I trailing behind. When the path started to descend, Laura tried slowing us down by putting his feet out, against the ground, since the brakes on his bike had worn out and we couldn't afford replacements. The decline became too steep, and we rode over a hole, launching me off the back of his bike and sending me rolling down the sides of the trail. I must have hit my head on a rock or log along the way, because the next thing I remembered, I woke up alone in the forest. I tried calling out for my brothers, but the forest was eerily quiet. Being only six or seven at the time, my only logic was to climb back up to the trail, hoping to find my brothers waiting there still. When I reached the top, I didn't find them, but I saw tread marks that continued down the rest of the path. I followed them until they disappeared off the trail and over the side of the hill as well. I called out for them, but got no response. I went down the hill, grabbing onto weeds and branches to slow my descent. When I reached the bottom, I didn't find my brothers or their bikes, so I picked a direction and started walking, paying attention to the ground for tread marks or shoe prints. The trees were tall in this forest, so I couldn't tell how much time had passed or how late it was. Every so often I'd call for them, but my echoes only bounced further and further away each time. I started to get scared, because while walking in the shade of the trees, I kept hearing whispering. I knew they weren't my brother's voices, because my brothers didn't know English well enough to say complete sentences. When I came across the old small school, there were vines growing all over the sides. The school only had one entrance and one big window, but didn't have a door or window panes. I thought it was abandoned at first, until I saw a kid with blonde hair at the window, staring out at me. Then I heard a woman's voice from inside telling him to sit back down. He looked sad as he disappeared back into the dark room. I thought it was strange that there was a school in the middle of the forest, and that the school didn't use any light. Maybe they were just trying to save electricity, like how my dad made us wait until it was very dark outside before we could turn on the house lights. I hadn't planned on going inside to ask for help, because I couldn't speak English well either, and because the school looked a little scary. But as I walked away, the teacher came to the entrance and said something to me, which sounded like a whisper in my ear, even though she was standing so far away. I couldn't understand what she was saying, but she looked like a nice old lady with her black hair tied up in a bun. She wore clothes that didn't look like what other people in my neighborhood wore. Most people wore t-shirts or shorts during the summer but this teacher was wearing a white shirt with buttons and long sleeves, and it was puffy at her neck. She also wore a very big fat dress that touched the ground. I wondered how she was able to stand the heat wearing all that. When I didn't go to her, she came out of the school and came to grab my hand. Her touch was a little cold, but she was gentle, so I followed her into the school. There I saw 15 students, sitting at long desks, arranged in two rows. 
They were all staring at the board, which had nothing written on it. They were all white and had blonde hair. Our neighborhood didn't have any white children, so I'd never seen so many before. They also wore clothes that were different from what I was wearing. Most of them looked like they were going to church, in their nice black pants and gray shirts with long sleeves and black suspenders. I felt a little embarrassed because I was only wearing plastic flip-flops and a dirty tank top that used to belong to my brother Jameson. The teacher said some things to them. Then she turned to me and said something I didn't understand. She pointed to an empty seat in the back row. I sat down. I don't know how long I sat with them, but after a while I fell asleep. When I woke up, I heard my brother's voices calling out my name. All of the students were gone, but the teacher sat on her desk, facing the chalkboard. She'd let her hair down. It was very long and spilled over the desktop. Her shoulders were moving up and down like she was quietly crying into her hands. Sometimes my mom did that after she and my dad argued. Outside, the forest had gotten darker. I wondered why no one had woke me up before they left. I spoke to the teacher, but she didn't turn to face me. Maybe it was because she couldn't understand Mong. I went to the doorless entrance and called back to my brothers. Laura was the first to get to me, giving me a few raps on the top of my head with his knuckles, asking, where did you go? We were all looking for you. Why didn't you answer? I told him I did and began crying, the top of my head beginning to throb. He yanked me by the hand out of the school, and when I looked back to say goodbye to the teacher, she was no longer sitting there. My brothers then got into an argument about whose fault it had been that I'd gotten lost in the first place. I told them I was tired and hungry, so we headed home. They asked what I'd been doing in the forest, and I told them about the school, the teacher, and the students. My brothers all turned to look at one another and started pedaling faster, looking over their shoulders back into the forest. When we got home, my brothers told me not to tell our parents what had happened, because they'd be mad that I'd gotten lost and my brothers would get into trouble. And if they got in trouble, I could never hang out with them again. So I didn't tell my parents. Years later in high school, during history class one day, my teacher was sharing local historical facts when she showed us a picture of an orphanage. The picture had an old woman with black hair tied up in a bun with a big fat black dress that touched the ground. Standing around her were 15 little white children with blonde hair. The teacher told us the old lady used to run an orphanage alone in the middle of a big forest nearby. Until one day, authorities identified her as the former head nurse from the local hospital who'd been guilty of child abduction. When the police tried to take the kids away, she'd blockaded the door and window and burned the orphanage with all the children and herself inside. One hour east of San Diego lies beautiful Mount Laguna. At 6,000 feet above sea level, this forested oasis rises above a vast desert and is known for its collection of Jeffrey Pines. My newly wedded wife, along with our two best friends, had spent the afternoon preparing for our annual late summer camping trip to the area. Stocked full of our favorite camping goodies and enough alcohol to last the weekend over, we found ourselves in great spirits, looking forward to our weekend in the forest. A few miles before our exit, my favorite Florida Georgia line song, one I'd heard a million times before, was interrupted by a phone call from my best friend Jason. His voice boomed over my car's Bluetooth. Hey, he said. We're going to get off at Pine Valley to grab firewood. Perfect, I responded, as firewood was the one thing I had forgotten. I'll follow you. I handed the phone to my wife to ask if she'd replay the song when I was quickly interrupted and told to take the next exit two lanes over. I veered over as quickly as possible, cutting off a large truck and simultaneously apologizing. The exit took us into Pine Valley, 
a beautiful pine tree dotted community similar to the small towns outside of Yosemite National Park. After two minutes driving down the main road, we made a left into the general store, which was surprisingly well stocked with anything you'd ever need for a luxurious weekend of camping. The clerk helped carry our six bundles of firewood to the trucks, and the girls stayed in the car. After setting my bundles in the truck bed, I was shaken by what I saw in the tinted reflection of my back window. Jason had dropped his firewood and was in full sprint towards his truck, yelling. I ran over to find his girlfriend in tears, wide-eyed and pale. I hugged her until Jason came jogging back. Completely out of breath, he said, Did you see that man trying to get into the truck? My heart sank. I responded with a dismal no. We agreed it was some creep who had never made it out of this small town and preyed upon passing tourists. As quickly as the ordeal started, it stopped, and we made our way up the mountain, speakers blazing, as if to drown out any recollection of what had just occurred. That night, our camp was set in record time. The kitchen, tents, easy up, and campfire were all ready to go in under half an hour. With no further responsibilities and the star's illuminating glow on full display, we decided to look for conversation at the bottom of a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue. Two hours went by before a consensus to embark on a night hike. As we started down the trail towards the edge of our campground, I couldn't help but notice the hair standing straight on the back of my neck. I'm a fan of ghost stories, so it was not out of character to be a little scared, wandering into the night. I had, however, drank more than my fair share of whiskey, and was able to shake the unnerving feeling of being watched. We took an unmarked trail, leading to a meadow surrounded by thick forest on either side. The girls were laughing at each other's jokes, the guys were rolling their eyes, and the night was headed in the perfect direction. Right as the meadow came to an end, and the trail led into a thick, forested overgrowth, Jason, who was leading our hike, gestured for the girls to go ahead so he could walk with me. Once the girls took the leader position, he grabbed my forearm with a force so hard I almost yelled in pain. The only reason I kept quiet was because of the look of absolute dread in his eyes as he whispered, The man from earlier is just beyond the tree line. I pushed him back on the trail as if everything was normal. If this psychopath really was following us, the last thing we needed was for him and more importantly the girls to know. As we fell back into our single file pace, I saw the man walking no less than 50 feet away, hunched over in a manner similar to a wolf stalking prey. The blood drained from my head and a sharp pain of sheer stress went shooting through my shoulders. The scariest part was that I was only seeing him from my peripheral vision as I refused to turn my head out of fear that he'd notice me noticing him. From what little I could see, it was pretty clear that he had a machete or a large knife. My adrenaline pumped through my veins like a riptide in the ocean. I wittingly blurted out that we'd left our campfire burning and had to return to camp immediately before I received a ticket from the park ranger. The girls reluctantly agreed. They were by the book and hated the idea of breaking any laws. They skipped hand in hand back to camp. The juxtaposition of their mood compared to ours was so polar opposite, it brought upon a sense of painful confusion. Again, this could have been the whiskey, but my brain could not calculate how two individuals could be having possibly the best night of their life, while we were seemingly drained of all life. As Jason walked to my side, eyes straight ahead as to not raise any further suspicion, I saw something I will never forget. Tears were running down his pale face, and he'd been clenching his fists so hard his fingernails drove into his palms, drawing blood. We walked for what seemed like an eternity, but in all reality was just over 15 minutes back to our campsite. I forced Jason to take the lead, 
and we walked no less than a body's length from the girls. Our stalker walked off to the side of us the entire way back. At this point, I was sure he knew I could see him. I thought of the sick pleasure running through his mind, of watching a poor 25-year-old man squirm, under the pressure of protecting his new wife and friends from an armed psychopath in the middle of the forest. His stalking became somewhat of an unbearable taunting, to the point that I almost broke down, telling everyone to run. Just as I was about to open my mouth, we'd made it back to camp. I then mustered up the courage to lie, and say I could see a camp ranger at our site, to which the girls took off running in an attempt to remedy the impending fine. As they took their first hurried steps, I heard loud footsteps to my left. I turned and saw our stalker running as fast as he could. He was barefoot, wearing nothing but ripped jeans, and brandishing that large knife. Now was the time to scream so I let out the loudest RUN I had ever yelled in my life. He ran over Jason, knocking him out cold on the ground. Luckily, the other campsites had heard my plea for help. As I ran towards our stalker, bracing myself for imminent damage, three other campers tackled him to the ground. It took five full-grown men and the park ranger's taser to subdue this overgrown creature. I can't even call him a human. As we brought him down, he screamed. At this moment, the girls saw Jason, lying unconscious, and the gravity of the situation had set in. Their ear-piercing screams, coupled with the looks in the stalker's crazy wild eyes, was the most frightening thing I've ever experienced. Unable to move by the weight of the campers, he lay motionless, except for his eyes. They swirled about in uncontrollable circles dilated and bulging. Fear had paralyzed my body, and the adrenaline came down so quickly, I fainted. I awoke to the foul scent of smelling salts, and a blinding set of red and blue police lights. Some friendly paramedics took my vitals, as the park ranger questioned me. I was still in shock, and could only give a mild, recounted version of what had happened. My wife and friends, safe in the back of an ambulance, which filled my heart with comfort, was immediately replaced with fear at the sight of the psychotic man in the back of a squad car being driven off, ramming his head into the window. Blood started to smear the glass from his broken skin. He eventually stopped, but only to stare directly into my eyes with a nightmarish smile. We learned he was a convicted killer and had recently escaped from a psych ward. He clearly had his wits about him, as he was over 20 miles from the institution and functioning enough to ruin what would turn out to be our last camping trip to Mount Laguna. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. If you want me to tell your story, or read a creepypasta, email me at the address in the description. Nice, I love this song. What's up, man? How's it going? Good, you? Alright, just the gum? Uh, give me a pack of red 72s. Uh-oh, you wanna buy something else? Why? Your total is 666. Nah, dude, that's fine. I don't believe in all that bullshit. Have a good day. You too, man. You've got a real zest for life. What the fuck? Corey. Jesus. Wrong. Who the hell are you? It is I, the Lord of the Flies. It is I? What is this, medieval times? I mean, who says that? Well, listen, I'm very old. All right. So what do you want? I came to tell you that because you're obsessed with three sixes, you will end up burning in hell for eternity. I'm not obsessed with three sixes. 
I like the number because people are scared of it. I mean, I like 7 and 13 too, for the same reason. And there's no such thing as hell or the devil. And yet here I sit. Well, prove it then. Do something to that guy over there. Oh my god. That's messed up, man. <laughs> but I know for a fact you're not the devil. How's that? Because you're just me, with a voice changer on. Oh shit. Ugh, you fucking asshole. Stupid bitch. Be good to animals. Even people. See ya. Who'd been guilty of child no! abduction? Jesus! You scared the fucking shit out of me! Who'd been guilty of child abduction? No! Ripley, let me read this. God damn, you scared me.